The inertia of an object is its tendency to resist changes in its velocity. So here we have an object moving with this velocity. We can call it V. All objects in the universe want to continue with whatever velocity they have. They resist changes in their velocities. So if this object is left alone, it will continue with this velocity forever. That is, it will move with constant speed in this straight line forever. So this fact is known as Newton's first law of motion. Now it's important to remember that changing an object's velocity involves changing its speed, or changing its direction, or changing both speed and direction. It's possible to change the direction of this object without changing its speed. We could have the object move in this direction here. So it's changed this direction of motion, but these two vectors have the same magnitude, so the speed is the same. So even without changing the speed, the object will resist changes in the direction of its motion. Now the more massive an object is, the greater is its inertia. Suppose we have a more massive object with the same velocity v. It's got, it's got much more mass. Well, it is more difficult to change the velocity of this new object than the velocity of the previous object. This new object has more inertia. It has got greater resistance to a change in its velocity. So, as I've mentioned already, this property of the inertia of an object leads on to what's called Newton's force law. So, as I've mentioned already, Newton's force law, or the law of inertia, says that an object moves at constant velocity if left alone. Constant velocity, as I've said before, means constant speed in a straight line. So that is not something that we experience every day. When we see objects moving, we usually see them slowing down and stopping. We rarely see objects moving with constant velocity. So, in everyday experience, objects are not left alone. Something prevents them from moving with constant velocity. What prevents objects from moving with constant velocity is forces on the object. So that leads us into the concept of a force on an object. A force is anything that causes an object to change its velocity. So let's take an example. Suppose we have a particle here with velocity u. So here is velocity u. If this particle is left alone, that is if no forces act on it, we know from Newton's first law that the particle will move with constant velocity u. That means it will move in this straight line with constant speed forever. By the way, the speed of this particle is the magnitude of vector u, which can be written as u without an arrow. Now, suppose that this object's velocity changes. That is, this particle accelerates. Okay, so it's very important here that we are to realize that we are dealing with changes in velocity, in other words, accelerations. So, the particle gets to here with a new velocity. Let's call this new velocity v. So, to keep things simple, I will assume that the velocity changes in magnitude only, it doesn't change in direction. So what has happened here is that the particle has speeded up, but it's still moving in the same direction. Its new speed would be written v without the arrow. Now, furthermore, assume that the acceleration of the particle is constant. So a is constant. How would we find a if it's constant? Well, we're dealing with linear motion with constant acceleration, so it's final velocity minus initial velocity divided by the time taken for the particle to move from here to here. 
Okay, so this formula is only valid if um, the acceleration is constant or uniform. What is the d direction of this acceleration vector? Well, we can see that it's in the same direction as the velocity of the particle. We could show vector A here. Okay, you know, A is just vector V minus vector U. Well, that's a vector in the same direction as these vectors, two vectors. You know, if we take vector V and subtract vector U, we get a shorter vector pointing in the same direction as both V and U. And then we divide by T. Well, T is just a scalar. So you can see that, you can actually see that A is in the same direction as the change in the velocity. Okay, the change of the velocity is what's on top final velocity minus initial velocity. And that's true in general, actually. Um, you know, we could imagine a more complicated situation where V has a different d direction to U. Okay, you could imagine a situation where V is like this, and U is like this. How would we find a change in the velocity V minus U? Well, we'd have to do a more complicated procedure here. We couldn't just get the magnitude of V and subtract the magnitude of U as we do when the particle is moving in a straight line. You know, to get V minus U in a more complicated situation, we'd have to show V like this. Um, let's see now, U would be like this here. And we'd have to join up the heads of these two vectors. Okay. Um, v minus U would actually be this would be this vector here. I'll do it in green. This would be V minus U. Okay, we saw this in the in the section on vectors. U plus V minus U is V. So it's more complicated. But the acceleration would be in the direction of the change in velocity. So everything on top here is the change in velocity. We could write this as delta V, meaning the change in the velocity. I use the letter V here instead of the letter U because V is used for a general velocity, whereas u is more a specific velocity, that's the initial velocity. Alright, um, so anyway, that's the more complicated situation, which we do actually cover in the section on projectile motion. We saw that the acceleration of a particle is vertically down, even though the velocity is not, you know, the velocity might be going, the particle might be going in this direction. So this would be the trajectory of the particle the projectile that's fired near the Earth's surface. So the change in velocity would be in the direction of the acceleration. Okay, so let's go back to this simple of case, this simple case here where the acceleration is constant. Um, now, we say that a force caused this acceleration, and a force is in the same direction as the acceleration. Well, more accurately, we should say that the resultant force on this object is in the direction of the acceleration. Several forces could have acted on this object. You know, we could have a force in this direction, another force in this direction here, another one in this direction. But if we get the vector sum of these three forces, the resultant force will be in the direction of the acceleration. Okay, so that's what Newton's second law says. If a particle is acted upon by one or more forces, the particle accelerates in the direction of the resultant force on the particle. I will show the resultant force here in black. Now I'll use the letter capital F to stand for the resultant force on the particle. So the resultant force F acts on the particle as the particle moves from here to here, and then the force stops acting. And when the force stops acting, the particle continues on with this new velocity v forever until another force acts on the particle to change that velocity v. So this for force, constant force, constant resultant force f acts on the particle as it moves from here to here. So the acceleration is constant. So that's how we define the resultant force on the particle. We define it in terms of the acceleration. We also define it in terms of the mass of the particle. The mass of this particle is m. The magnitude of the acceleration is given by the magnitude of the resultant force, capital F, divided by the mass of the particle. 
Now this way of defining F, the resultant force on the particle, makes sense. You know, if we can imagine increasing the resultant force on the particle. So imagine that F increases. But the mass does not increase. The mass stays the same. Well, we would expect the acceleration of the particle to go up. So we would expect the particle's velocity to have a greater change if the fo resultant force on the particle is greater. Okay, the final velocity v would turn out to be greater, so v minus u would be um, greater. Now what about the mass? Well, we know that all particles or objects have inertia that is resistance to acceleration. And the greater the mass, the greater the inertia, the greater the resistance to acceleration. So we would expect that as the mass goes up, for a given force, now we have the same force, resultant force F acting, then the acceleration will go down. Okay, so if we increase M, we decrease the acceleration if we keep the resultant force fixed. We can summarize Newton's second law by this vector equation. We said that the acceleration vector A is in the same direction as the resultant force on the particle F. So you can see that in this equation here because F is just a scalar multiple of A. M, remember, is a positive number. M is a positive quantity. So if we multiply a positive scalar by a vector, well, we get a, this new vector F, which is in the same direction as vector A. And, uh, you know, we can rearrange this to write A equals the resultant force on the particle divided by the mass. And if we take magnitudes, we just get A equals the magnitude of F divided by M. Okay, so we can summarize the direction of the resultant force and the magnitude of the resultant force or the magnitude of the acceleration by this equation here. So this equation summarizes Newton's second law. It's very important to realize that this here is the resultant force on the particle. There could be many forces acting on the particle. So we have to consider the resultant force. That's the vector sum of the forces acting on the particle. And to keep things simple, we will deal with constant forces. Okay, so this resultant force doesn't change as the particle it moves, you know, from this position to this new position here. Um, so the particle will have constant acceleration as it moves from here to here. Now let's take a, a different case. Again, we start off with a particle with velocity u. No forces act on it, so by Newton's first law, it continues with that velocity u forever. All of a sudden, a constant force acts on the particle, but this time the constant force is in a direction opposite to the velocity of the particle. Let's suppose that, I'm trying to draw this here, the resultant force looks like this. Now this force could come about from many forces acting on the particle. You know, we might have a force acting in this direction, another force acting in this direction, and we could have gotten the vector sum of these two forces and found that the resultant is this force here. So we can replace those two constituent forces with vector f. So that it's the case of two forces acting on the particle, but it could be a three or more or any number of forces acting on the particle. Let's suppose the particle is mass m. So anyway, this constant for resultant force acts on the particle for a certain amount of time. So we can guess what's going to happen here. It's pretty clear that the particle is going to slow down. So the particle is accelerating now because there's a f resultant force acting on it. So its velocity, is, that means its velocity is going to change. So its final velocity, v, is going to look something like this. So its velocity vector is going to decrease in magnitude. Okay, the speed of the particle is going to decrease. So we can see here that v is smaller than u in magnitude. So while the force is acting, we could... Um, uh, consider the get the acceleration from this formula here. Okay, final velocity minus initial velocity divided by the time taken for the velocity to go from u to v. Newton's second law tells us that the acceleration is in the same direction as the resultant force. So I'll try to show the acceleration vector here. Okay, 
um, you can see it from this too. You know, the change in the velocity is going to be in this direction because v is less than u in magnitude. So we're taking a quantity that's smaller than u. Um, if we work out v minus u, we get something negative. You know, if we take th this direction here to be positive, then this direction here will be negative. So a will point in the negative direction. Okay, so the acceleration is in the same direction as this change in velocity, v minus u. Since the particle is slowing down, we could say that the particle is decelerating. If this constant force keeps acting on the particle, the particle could slow down to zero. Okay, so say the particle gets to here, it could suddenly stop. Well, well, it has to stop if this force keeps acting on it, you know. If this force stops acting on it, then the particle will continue on with whatever velocity it had when the particle stopped, when the force stopped acting on the particle. But the force could keep acting on the particle until the particle stops. So V will be naught. And if the force continues to act on the particle, then the particle will reverse direction and move in the, down this way. Finally, let's consider the most complicated situation. So again, we'll start off with a particle that has velocity u. Particle is left alone, so it's coasting away with constant velocity u. All of a sudden, forces act on the particle. And, okay, we don't know what kind of forces act on it, but let's suppose that all those forces are constant for simplicity. And the resultant force, that's the sum, vector sum of all those forces, is in this direction here. So again, I will use capital F to stand for the resultant force on the mass. So this resultant force acts for a short time on the particle, or any length of time, it doesn't matter. What's the direction of the particle's acceleration? Well, it's in the same direction as the resultant force. It's this way. Does that mean that the particle will move in this direction? No. But the particle's trajectory is going to change. So the particle is going to, might move in this kind of trajectory here. Okay, it might look more like this actually. The velocity of the particle is always tangential to the trajectory of the particle. So for example, when the particle is here, and I'm assuming that this resultant force is constant, hasn't changed, then the resultant force is still the same. The velocity is tangent to the trajectory. So this would be the new velocity after some time t later. Now we can't just write down vector a equals vector v minus vector u divided by t in this situation. Okay, this is not the acceleration of the particle. This would be the average acceleration of the particle, okay? The average acceleration of the particle as it goes from here to here. Um, to get the acceleration at this instant, we would have to, you know, consider the mass in a new position, just a tiny, an infinitesimal amount of time t later, and then take the two velocities, you know, v and u, subtract them, so v would now be in this direction, you know. So this would involve calculus. And uh, we do this kind of thing in the section on circular motion, where we consider the acceleration of a particle moving in a circle. But um, we won't get into that here. Just to say that this would be the average acceleration of the particle as it moves from this position to this new position over here. Getting v minus u is more complicated here. You know, if you want to get it, you could show v over here. Okay, so this vector is meant to be the same as this vector. Then I can show u here. And how do I show v minus u? I join the tails, or sorry, the heads of these vectors. So this is what v minus u would look like. Okay, we saw that in the section on vectors, the difference of two vectors. So this is just the average acceleration. It's not the instantaneous acceleration, because the time t is not infinitesimal. Okay. That's the time taken for particle to go from here to here.
So anyway, you, we can see that this force changes the direction of the particle. Because this force vector is not along this line here. It's not along the line that the velocity of the particle u was on. So in general, the force will change not just the speed, but also the direction. In other words, it, it will change the velocity. It will accelerate the particle. And that acceleration is in the same direction as the resultant force. So when the particle is over here, the acceleration again is like this. And if the resultant force is constant, then the acceleration hasn't changed. So this vector A is the same as this vector here. Now, in the section on projectile motion, we considered objects freely moving near the Earth's surface. And the only force acting on those objects was Earth's gravity, which is actually directed towards the center of the Earth, which means it's vertically down. So the resultant force on this object is vertically down. Okay, there's no air resistance. If there was air resistance, then we would have a force on this particle in a direction opposite to its velocity. So we, ju we will just pretend that there's no air. Um, so the particle at this position has velocity u. So this force F always acts on the particle. So when the particle is here, the force is the same. This vector is identical to this vector here. But you can see that the velocity has changed, of course. The velocity is always tangential to the trajectory of the particle. So if F is the only force acting on it, the gravitational force on the particle, then F is the resultant force on the particle. So we can apply Newton's second law. So the magnitude of F is the mass of the particle times the acceleration of the particle. Now what's the acceleration of the particle? Well, we saw that for any mass near the Earth's surface, the acceleration is constant. The acceleration due to gravity is constant. So it doesn't matter how big or small this mass is. I can make this mass much greater than what it is. The acceleration is always going to be a constant. 9.81 meters per second squared. And the letter G was used to denote that acceleration. So we're just applying Newton's second law here. Uh, F is the only force acting on the particle, hence it's the resultant force on the particle. So it's the mass of the particle times the acceleration, which is denoted by the letter G. Okay, so there's this is G. Now the force of gravity, of Earth's gravity on the particle, well it doesn't have to be Earth's gravity, it could be any planet's gravity, but we will just be dealing with Earth's gravity, um, is known as the weight of the particle. We can call it W. Now, what about the unit of force? Well, the unit of force is the Newton. So, let's suppose that we have a person of mass 80 kilograms. Okay, mass must be measured in kilograms. Then, if that person is near the Earth's surface, the force of Earth's gravity on that person is 80 times 9.81. So, it means that the weight of the person is approximately the mass 80 times 9.81. I'll replace 9.81 with 10. Okay, so I'll multiply the mass by g. Uh, that's that's 800 newtons. So weight is measured in newtons, not in kilograms or pounds or ounces, um, as in everyday usage. So weight is a force, and a force is measured in newtons. So this will be the force of gravity on a person. So the person's mass is 80 kilograms, and the mass never changes. If the person is near the surface of the Earth, the Earth's gravity, force of gravity on the person is 800 newtons. If the person is well away from the surface of the Earth, several thousand miles above the surface of the Earth, well then, um, the weight will be considerably less than 800 newtons. If the person is on the Moon, the person's weight will be six times less. So we would have to divide 800 by six. If the person is way out in outer space, well away from any planet, our gravitational force and no other forces are acting on the person well no gravitational forces are acting on the person then the weight of the person is zero so the person is weightless now here is an important point a person in orbit around the earth say a person working in the on a space station around the earth is not weightless 
Okay, this is very important. Uh, you know, in everyday language, we say that the person is weightless. Okay, so here's the Earth, and here's a person in orbit. Or maybe there's a satellite in orbit around the Earth, moving around the Earth. Or there's an astronaut um, yet in a space station. The space station is orbiting the Earth. And uh, that person is not weightless, because there is a force of gravity on the person. So if the person is here, the force of gravity is directed towards the center of the Earth. Now, since the person is a long way from the center of the Earth, that force of gravity would not normally be given by m times g. Okay, we wouldn't multiply the mass of the person by 9.81. Um, g would be a lot smaller than 9.81. We would use a much smaller number. So we get a, a much smaller weight for that person. But the person isn't weightless. If the person was weightless, then the person... There, there would be no gravitational force acting on the person. The person would have to be way out in outer space.